Why, hello. Welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. And I'm back in Connecticut. If you are a long-term listener who maybe views uh, the video version of our podcast, uh, maybe on YouTube or on Facebook, you may recognize that I am in my old studio. <laughs> and uh, Tom is in Connecticut, but Glenn, Glenn is somewhere else. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, let you know in a minute. We'll let him tell you where he is in a minute. But anyway, we're glad to have you with us. And because I'm back in Connecticut, I've got a Connecticut brew I just want everybody to know about. I have the Holy Grail uh. of IPAs right here. Yeah. This is Hetty Topper by The Alchemist in Vermont, rated number one, numero uno IPA in the world. <laughs> so like when you go to like Vermont and you're walking around, the Vermont breweries are so good that you hear German accents everywhere. There is the beer. <laughs> anyway, that's a compliment. <laughs> and that's right, and, and, they, and they're they're there for this stuff. Anyway, this I, I actually I actually got it in Connecticut. The very first time I've seen it anywhere outside of Connecticut. The Alchemist is owned by an old hippie who just, on principle, makes his beer hard to get. You know, he's just against capitalism and he's 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 comfortable and doesn't care about making any more money and he just wants to make it difficult on everybody to get his beer and it's what it's resulted in is like a cult and i am a member of that cult so i'm going to enjoy heady tidy topper here and you might be wondering who is this guy who's talking i'm cr wiley i'm a pastor i actually serve a church in the pacific northwest but i am a jet setter i've got a home in battleground washington and another in Tallinn, connecticut and I am out of touch with the time zones. I just kind of live in days. Anyway, that's enough about me. I've got a book out, a book out on Tom Bombadil. And, uh, it, and, and here it is. I actually have a physical copy of it. For those of you who can see what I'm holding up, there it is. And uh, I, 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 I was pleased to see that they finally got some copies uh, on Amazon, and then they sold out like in a couple of days. So that's a good news, bad news thing. So at the moment, you can only get uh, a copy, a physical copy through Canon Press, which is not a bad thing. You know, look up the Canon Press people, order it there. But if you're like a diehard Amazon person, then uh, you're just going to have to settle for the Kindle version for a little bit uh, until they are able to restock. Anyway, enough about me. How about you, Glenn? You world traveler, you? <laughs> um, well, I haven't been traveling around the world much lately, but uh, I am... Currently in an undisclosed location, um, actually it's South Bend, Indiana, um, not far from the, about four blocks from the University of Notre Dame, which is not to be confused with Notre Dame. Um, I am a professor emeritus of history at Central Connecticut State University. I write for Breakpoint and uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And my main gig right now is I'm a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries under Ken Boa. Yeah, our good friend Ken. It'll be great to see him again someday. You get to see him a lot more than we do, but that's great. Good stuff. Okay, Tom. Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, ethics, and philosophy at a variety of places, one of which is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary at which I am back for J-Term. So uh, I am current, currently teaching um, <laughs> there a good uh, social ethics or Christian ethics in society. Ooh. So gets me into the, uh, the heart of things. Working on a book, on, yeah. uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a theological and ethical primer connected also with kind of some current challenges from the world of technology. And I've decided and started a little kind of lay level book um, called Tea Time with Idols <laughs> and something I want to int <laughs> introduce a little more, but it's really about the way in which evangelical spirituality is so so um, void of content that it, it's borrowing from new ageism, secularism, and uh, yoga and all the like to fill the vacuum left by uh, practices that are have become um, uh, basically uh, eclipsed um, in terms yeah. of spiritual yeah. life connected to theology. So it's long overdue. The evangelical world needs a little rebuke in that area, and it's time. So that is kind of, you know, so I got a lot going on. That's just a, you know, a few ideas, but that stuff's in progress. Um and, you know, that's enough for now. 
Well, you know what we ought to do is we ought to get like a video of you rebuking some people. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. Re- I rebuke you. <laughs> it's time anyway. for the rebuke. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, this is a, an interesting segue into the topic of the day. By the way, I'm the guy with the topic for the day. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Stoicism and Epicureanism. And I think it's important to address those uh, the schools of philosophy from antiquity for a couple of reasons. One is we see some Stoic and Epicurean philosophers in the New Testament right there in Athens and Acts chapter 17. Uh, the Apostle Paul is interacting with those guys uh, at Mars Hill. Some interesting stuff going on there. If you're familiar with the schools, you would understand the nature of the conflict uh, that was uh, you know, uh, occurring. Uh, if you're not, you may be just puzzled with why in the world the Apostle Paul was spending time talking to those guys or how it was that he came to actually know uh, enough Stoicism that he could quote a couple of Stoic philosophers off the top of his head. We'll get into some of that. Uh, but what inspired me to get into this today is I, I've, I've been, I just finished uh, reading a book by Elizabeth Lash Quinn entitled Ars Vitae. Now, uh, means Art of Life, and uh, the subtitle is The Fate of Inwardness and the Return of the Ancient Arts of Living. Hmm. Now, Elizabeth Lash Quinn is the daughter of one of my, you know, great uh, intellectual, you know, uh, heroes, Christopher Lash, the historian. Christopher Lash, uh, you know, is a guy that we've talked about on the show before, but uh, just a, a, a monumental you know, guy in terms of his scholarship. And, and just you read him and you say, how does anybody, you know, know as much as this guy knows <laughs> or knew? Because he's been <laughs> gone for a little while. His great book or sort of the book that became a national phenomenon is Car- Cultural Narcissism, in which he's actually reflecting on some of the things that his daughter is addressing in this book. Mm. And the culture of narcissism is talking about kind of, well, a phenomenon in our society with uh, the solipsism or solipsism. So uh, Philip Reef, that name may, may ring a bell because of the recent book by Carl Truman, uh, in which he was reflecting upon uh, sort of therapeutic culture, which is, a, which is something that Philip Reef discussed and commiserated about in uh, his writings. And uh, so this sort of obsession with the self ungrounded uh, in metaphysics and unconnected to community is what we see all around us today. And so in this book, she's, she's noting that there, have been, there are efforts in our time to revive uh, approaches to life uh, from the various schools of philosophy and antiquity and we see those things actually at Barnes and Noble, and you know, books and conferences, and 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 uh, TED talks, and <laughs> you name it. Uh, and basically, they're all addressing this problem. And what she uh, presents is an argument, uh, essentially saying that uh, the new Stoicism, the new Epicureanism, even the new Cynicism, they all fall short because they lack the moral content and metaphysical grounding of the uh, schools in the ancient world. So I thought, well, I, I agree with you, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> I think that's right. And, uh, but I thought it would be good to, to get into it a little bit because some of our listeners may be aware of some of the popular or pop Stoic you know, uh, writers or the pop Epicurean writers or even the cynics that are out there. So any thoughts you guys have on those things before we jump into the, the schools? But also, uh, also as a compliment, uh, you know, uh, to those who actually, you know, especially kids in these classical curriculums, they actually are reading these figures, and so they may be at m- more at home with this kind of stuff than than people that 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 have not been, you know, um, their so parents, they, for example. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> their parents, they know the names, but they don't know exactly why they know. <laughs> know them. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, 
a lot of them I don't even think they know the names. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's my. I, my I, I did. I did a homeschooling term, and I one thing I did learn in doing it is that I was doing more of the learning than my child was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. you know, yeah. Chris, let me let me jump in. Sure. I think I think that her criticism. <clears throat> that they're trying to look at the ethics without having the metaphysical foundation. I think that's really important because one of the things I've argued for years now, even before the resurgence of Stoicism and such, is that we have a disintegrated worldview in our culture. We believe certain things about metaphysics, whether we realize it or not. We believe certain things about knowledge and truth, whether we realize it or not. Sometimes those two are connected, but not always. But ethics is never connected into the metaphysics or the epistemology. Yeah, yeah, that's a great um, point. And this, is, this has been a, a structural problem in um, worldviews in America for decades now. Yeah, yeah, there's a, uh, there's kind of a self, people behave in sort of contradictory ways, um, because nothing is, is sort of held together, or integrated. Yeah, Tom. And, and I do think, especially in the Protestant world, that that had a love hate relationship with with metaphysics for a long time. Understandably, in some contexts, ignorantly in others. And and I think because of that, um, what you have is when we seek to engage, you know, culture, the world with the gospel. Um, as Protestants, what we need to remember that is a big heart of everything we have to offer is the metaphysics of creation and redemption. Um, and and um, that there is a metaphysical dimension that actually probably is at the heart of the issues today. It's not simply the matter of application of the Bible, because the application of the Bible Um, to the current context is always going to either conform to the context or actually conform the context to the gospel. I mean, there there, there is an either or, and most of the time it's happening only in one direction. And so we really need to retrieve what the the Christian church carved out at the beginning um, uh, in in its doctrinal uh, solidifications concerning metaphysics and it was directly in an engagement with these philosophies yeah if i may add one more thing on it this is also one of the fundamental problems with the typical evangelical understanding of uh what the gospel is right you know it's sin and salvation which is true that's part of it but it's only part of it if you don't start with creation You get a disconnect metaphysically yeah. between, you know, uh, well, between metaphysics and, and ethics. Right. You know, you, you start with sin, and, and sin is a free-floating concept. Yeah. It's not anchored in creation. Yeah, it's usually anchored just in sort of my personal sort of inner life or my 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 feelings mm-hmm. of guilt because of some things that that I know mm-hmm. I did wrong. Or, but there's there's no. Uh, so it's it, it what ends up happening is because we don't have a a biblical understanding of creation, mm-hmm. uh, redemption is just simply the redemption of a soul yeah. rather than all of creation. And one one last point one last point is culture, whatever that may mean, or society tends to fill the gap now of creation. And so I don't want to lose right. that because I think that's a very significant point. Anyway, <laughs> I'll leave it with that. No, no, I, I, I think that's, I think that's right. So what we do is we fill the gap with yoga or social justice issues, you know, wokeism, yeah. whatever the, whatever the popular thing is at the moment to be relevant. So anyway, now, now you, some of our, some of our listeners might wonder whether or not, you know, we are departing from the magisterial magisterial reformers when we talk like this. <laughs> no, actually, what we're trying to do is recover what the magisterial reformers were up to. I've got a marvelous book, and I love to use this book to uh, rebuke, <laughs> rebuke, we're rebuking, <laughs> uh, those uh, people that I come across <laughs> who think that 
Uh, theology uh, has nothing to do or no, should take no interest in or spend any time addressing uh, philosophy or philosophers. And uh, what I love to do is use this book, yeah. Calvin and Classical Philosophy by Charles Partee. Yet yeah, we both have it. Nice. And it's a great yeah. treatment. It's, essentially, what he does is he goes through uh, Calvin's writings and draws out all the different things that he is is uh, refer- referencing uh, from uh, Aristotle or Plato or the Stoics, Seneca. You know, I was talking to my friend uh, Brad Beers, who teaches at Hillsdale College, and he wrote the inter- he wrote the foreword for my book on Bombadil, by the way. And uh, I said I, I, I was doing some stuff with Stoicism. And he said, you know. Calvin's first book. This guy is a traditionalist Catholic. He knows that Calvin's first work was on Seneca, and it was addressing Seneca Stoicism. So here, I rebuke you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, now, Chris, be fair. Calvin wrote his commentary on De Clementia before he he came to faith. Well, th- sure. It was in his sure. communist period. It still influenced him. But 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 being fair about this. by the way, what he was trying to do in there. Was, was a traditional thing that scholars do. Uh, he was trying to build his reputation by climbing over the bodies of his predecessors. Um, <laughs> he was taking on uh, Erasmus's interpretation of Seneca, right. uh, of that particular piece. But that, that doesn't change the fact that Stoicism clearly influenced Calvin's thought and it, and it, it um, yeah. shaped parts of his theology. And I would argue, and this, this is, a, I know, something that will, will uh, jar some people, I, I, I think that uh, the Apostle Paul read his Stoics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't just because he was walking through Athens and saw something, you know, on the bottom of an idol that was ascribed to a Stoic philosopher, and he just used that when he got to the Areopagus, or Areopagus, I should say. I think that, that uh, we have good reason to, to uh, believe, not just because he came from Tarsus, which was a center of Stoic philosophy, uh, but because of some of the ways that he, he uh, argues uh, in his letters that uh, he had read uh, Stoics. He read the Stoics. So I think uh, with those things in mind, I'd like to just kind of jump into the matter of, you know, what about these two schools? I'm not going to get into cynicism and Diogenes, the dog philosophy, or dog philosopher and all that kind of stuff. That would be a fun show for another time. But because we have explicit references in the New Testament to Stoicism and Epicureanism, and because those two schools uh, have seen a revival in our time, I'd like to get into them a little bit. Now, uh, I know, Glenn and Tom, you guys have done a lot of thinking about these things. Before we kind of get into a definition, what are, what are your thoughts about the phenomenon that we see in our day? Why why do you think Stoicism and, and Epicureanism have made a made the comebacks that they have? Um, I would say that it's because of the failure of modern secular philosophies to actually come up with answers, uh, deep seated, philosophically rooted. Uh, answers to the kinds of questions people naturally begin to ask. And the evangelical church and churches in general haven't done a really good job in presenting the historic Christian position either. So in the vacuum that's created by that, they're looking into these other uh, philosophies, or if you want to call them worldviews, that seem to offer them answers to some very serious questions that they're asking. Yeah, I think think that's a good point. I think, yeah, I think similarly, there there is a desire for wisdom, and I think the bankruptcy of of kind of contentless secularism um, really cries out for finding some kind of richer web of of meaning in life. And so, people either seek to retrieve; they either try to construct. Um, it's hard to construct without retrieving. So um, I think people turn towards schools of thought that offer some way of, of allowing human life and flourishing to, to kind of set, it, set its path. And so you, you see this in a whole, whole bunch of dimensions. I mean, you have one side that kind of moves the whole narrative postmodern world where 
cultures that have been kind of, you know, eclipsed by the Enlightenment kind of seek sources in themselves, their own stories and histories of, of marginalized groups. But then you also see these kind of uh, these kind of turns to the past and, and, and wisdom of the past and try to kind of bring it up to date. Um, and, I, and I think even as Christians, we, we wisely do similar things um, because um, we, we begin to recognize theologically that we are in the middle of things. We aren't the, the or origin of things. The Enlightenment tried to kind of deceive us that we're the origin of all things. And so what you see now is, is a form of renaissance. I mean, maybe Glenn could speak more to that, but a kind of retrieval of ancient sources of wisdom and practice um, that are there to be guides in some way. And I think that's healthy for Christians because that's been at the heart of their practice from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let me begin by uh, reading the passage that we've referred to uh, from Acts 17. It begins at verse uh, 16 and to, in order to provide a little context for our conversation. So here, uh, this is from the, the English Standard Version. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we learn or may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Now, you know, we've lived in places just like this, you know, Cambridge or, you know, New Haven or Ox Oxford, yeah. you know. We know exactly what he's getting at. And this, by the way, is a little tongue-in-cheek. And what we have here is a little side note or a comment coming from a highly educated fellow, Luke. So this is not just some guy who's, you know, feeling put out because he feels put down uh, being around all these snooty intellectuals. He, he, he could carry his own weight. But anyway, he's, he's having some fun here. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the, of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Um, Eusebio is the word there. It would mean pious. Or pi in other words, it's it's not religious often in the sense that we often think uh, mm -hmm. in the United States today. But anyway, verse 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself <laughs> gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Now, I want to stop here and say something, uh, add a little comment. At this point, Paul has said nothing controversial. Yeah. All those guys would have been nodding their heads at this point. See, a lot of folks in the evangelical world really think that uh, the whole, the whole uh, address was offensive. It wasn't. There was a lot of stuff that, uh, that, that he said that they would agree with. They believed in a God who transcended the world, who didn't need human beings, didn't, uh, wasn't served by human hands. They had a more sophisticated understanding of, of idols even than the typical evangelical. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so getting back to this, verse 26, and he made uh, from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of the dwelling place. Nothing controversial about that either. He, everybody would have said, of course, of course, of course. 
uh, that they should seek God, they would have said, of course, to that, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. They would have said, yes, yes, that's right. That's, <laughs> that's, right. A, that's a very yeah, interesting so, point. We'll get back to that. <laughs> you're right, right. <laughs> Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. They would ah. have all said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> For in him we live and move and have our being. He, here we see Paul quoting a, a, a Stoic. Yeah. And uh, even as some of you, your own poets, have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Again, he quotes another Stoic. Being, I can I can see the Stoics kind of looking over the Epicureans at this point and going, ah, <laughs> he's quoting our guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, a man or an image formed by the art or ima- and imagination of man. They would have said, yep, yeah. yep, yep. Yeah. They would have been with him on that. Uh, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now, this is getting into some territory that they, they might have They, they wouldn't about. be happy with. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Now their ears are starting to yeah. pick up. You know, you know, they're, they're, they're wondering, what is this about? And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, that would have brought the house down in terms of, Hoots and hollers and hisses and and all yeah. of that. That was the offense. Yeah. The resurrection was the offense. Yeah. yeah. And then he goes on to say, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Of course they would. We know these guys and what they thought. But others said, and this is interesting, we will hear you again on this. <laughs> so that's fascinating. So even in that fascinating. circle of of you know philosophers. There were some who were intrigued. What is this about? We want to know more. Anyway, so this is the background in terms of, you know, the ministry of the Apostle Paul, particularly in Athens, but I think throughout uh, the uh, the Greco-Roman world, uh, this was the intellectual atmosphere. And uh, so Paul, he demonstrates here that he could swim in two kinds of water. He can swim in synagogues, uh, you know, sort of the intellectual currents of the synagogue, but he can also swim uh, in the intellectual currents of the Hellenists. He, he knows their stuff. And he knew what he was doing. He, that, if you, do you follow that argument? It's a, it's a periodic argument. He's drawing them in, drawing them in, and then hits them at the very last moment yeah. with the wham. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very masterful uh, approach uh, rhetorically. And I and I think it it, it is it, it's just sound apologetics that the the created order has given much and that and rather than just condemning everything that is outside of a revealed scripture passage, recognizing that creation is a revelation of God, though distorted, can also be brought into alignment with the fuller revelation and therefore become a compelling um, witness. And so that's what you see going on there. I mean, you 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 have here um, a lot of sound wisdom that came out of the pagan world that Paul could affirm, and it's inerrant. <laughs> so so for for those who hold the inerrancy of scripture, here is Paul quoting these figures in an in an errant way, <laughs> if you will. Right, um, right. And he's bringing right. them into in an in inerrant word, and what he's what he's showing is is that though. Their knowledge is limited. It doesn't bring you into the triune life or to, into the incarnate relation with the incarnate one. It points to both. It points to both. Yeah, and when right. Christ is revealed, it shows that all of that knowledge does not end in paganism, but ends when it's properly weaned from the idols and purified. It points to Christ and the Trinity. I mean, that's that's you know yeah. you know a fuller interpretation of what's going on there. Yeah, and it also, um, I think, kind of shows the problem with people who reject ideas of natural theology. Yeah. Um, With people who argue that because reason is fallen, we cannot reason accurately about the world or about God. Um, Our reason certainly is fallen. There are noetic effects of the fall. That's right. But that doesn't mean that all our conclusions are necessarily going to be wrong. That's right. Right. You know, it's it's exactly the problem with people misunderstanding what total depravity means. It doesn't mean that we're as bad as we could possibly be. It doesn't matter that everything, it doesn't mean that everything that we do is wrong. It doesn't eradicate our creatureliness. 
The fall does not right. eradicate our creatureliness. I mean, that's I think I think that's where that's what um, sadly some some people think that it does. It totally time bombs everything creaturely to the point that a Gnostic alternative becomes attractive. And uh, our reason yeah, I, and our, our humanity is not eradicated. It's it's stained all the way down. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's an important thing to note. And, you know, I, I use uh, this approach sometimes when I talk to folks about this. Is two plus two right for a non-believer as well as a believer? Yeah. You know, in other words, two plus two equals four. In other words, is there a, is is because you're fallen, you're willing to accept that two plus two equals six? Well, maybe in the current situation we have in the state of Oregon, where <laughs> yeah. we've got issues related to well, there are the, math the, issues the, up there. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> well, it's happening everywhere. But, but, so. e- but, e- but even those people want to want to make sure that the planes fly and the bridges stand up, and people can be uh, you know uh, operated on by a competent surgeon. You know, so so the nonsense uh, stops when things the stakes are high. Yeah. But but my point is is that. Uh, you know, uh, people who uh, don't know Christ can uh, accurately or, or, or effectively and um, soundly use reason to arrive at truths that are just sound. Um, I, I ask sometimes, you know, uh, this, I, I kind of play with this a little bit more and I say, well, have you ever met a, a, an unbeliever that, could, that was really good at his job? <laughs> In other words, they the, the person wasn't always cutting corners, wasn't always trying to get as much as he could for nothing. Maybe he's a builder. Uh, he builds really good houses, sound houses, and and just about everybody I, I talk to says, "Of course, sure, I've, I've come across this." And then I then I'll ask him, "Have you ever come across a person who claims to be a Christian and doesn't do good work?" <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and they "Oh say, yeah, yeah, I got, I got, I got, you know, I got a, a list this that's, long." Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. So anyway, uh, in other words, the status of, of reason as a guide is uh, not affected uh, by our inability to reason well. Reason has some kind of status that uh, transcends, you know, even our, you know, uh, theological and spiritual commitments. Now, uh, getting back to, to getting back to this particular uh, incident, why why would the resurrection be the point of contention? Why would that offend the Stoics and the Epicureans? Now we know, but our audience doesn't. So let's let's help them let's help them understand what's what's going on there. Well, I think uh, one aspect is especially the world into which the gospel was going as it moved into the utter parts of the earth. Um, as it moved out of of the Hebraic background, was that that um, creation and nature were often seen as an antithesis to the spiritual and the divine, so that um, God identified with the spiritual um, was in conflict with was degraded in a sense when God associated in any way whatsoever with with the natural. And so the whole goal of, of liberation, similar to liberation theologies today and everything else, was to kind of be um, lifted up out of those determinations of the material and the natural, which keep us down, if you will, um, keep us from our true selves and everything else. Um, so even the body, where the body is kind of a bad cage that our ghost is locked in and so the goal of of salvation is to be liberated from this cage well the the christian vision is such that god's transcendence is such that it's it's so powerfully beautiful that god can affirm wholeheartedly the goodness of creation without it being in opposition to his distinction as infinite spirit and so the creation, in some ways, is an, a creaturely created analogy of the spiritual. Um, it participates in the spiritual, but it is also a creation, a contingent, finite thing that depends wholly on God for its being, existence, form, shape, and ends, and purpose. 
and it's good. It is fitting. It, it, it some way is a mirror, a image of the creator. And because of that, it can refract and participate in the joy of the creator in a creaturely way um, as it unfolds its own material nature. Um, and so the, the, the creaturely, in this sense, is not in opposition to the divine, but is actually analogous and fitting and corresponds to the divine when it's ordered the right way. Yeah, there's a... Uh... A cosmology that is uh, uh, kind of uh, in the background here, where and you're referring to it. Now, this this cosmology isn't necessarily Gnostic. So, like we, if we read, uh, you know, Plotinus, he would say that uh, the physical world that we have around us, in some sense, mirrors a spiritual reality. <clears throat> and consequently is ennobled by it and is something that ought to be uh, enjoyed and appreciated. Um, but at the same time, there's still this sense in which um, God could not be uh, understood as, as uh, well, coming to earth uh, as the Christian understanding of, in the, of the incarnation proclaims without in some sense polluting himself. Um, and so that, so I think that this is where we have to be kind of careful because I think a lot of, a lot of the polemic that we see directed toward anything Hellenist in character or origin is uh, very simply dismissed as Gnostic when in fact, I think we need to be a little more careful in understanding what, uh, people in the antiquity were saying um, Gnosticism was often sort of uh, condemned by Greek philosophers uh, as well as uh, church fathers. Anyway. Yeah. I, I think one distinction that I, I, that's helpful here is if you look at Platonism or if you look at the general philosophies of the day, the physical world is qualitatively inferior to the spiritual world. Right. In Gnosticism, it is morally inferior. In other words, the physical universe is genuinely evil, right. and the spiritual world is good. That's not where most of the Greek thought went. That's right, right, right. And so that, that difference between, you know, certainly the spirit, they saw the spiritual as superior, but the difference is qualitative rather than ethical or moral. Yeah, right. Good point. Well, let's let's zero in for a moment on the Stoics and the Epicureans and talk about their particular objection to this teaching of the, you know, that that Paul presents concerning the resurrection. The the Stoics and the Epicureans uh, had this in common even though they disagreed about a lot of things. They both agreed that um, when you die, you're dead. <laughs> it's just kind of over. <laughs> they were materialists who believed in God. Now, this is, this is something that is a little odd for most people today to sort of grasp or to sort of uh, entertain. For the Stoics and the Epicureans, they both believed that, that nature, the, the nature that we see around us, just kind of is what it is, and it's not fallen per se. It just is what it is. And we all know what happens to bodies when they die. Bodies, when they die, decompose. And both the Stoics and the Epicureans maintained that what we refer to as the spirit of a person is just a different kind of material substance. So they didn't understand spirit in the same way that we do. And they even believe that God uh, had a kind of uh, imminent kind of uh, status within the framework of the material world. So they, uh, they believed that, okay, in the course of nature, um, things come, things go. And, and this is kind of commonsensical if you think about it. Just you observe. You look around you every season. Yeah, flowers bloom and then flowers die. And then those dead flowers go 
and become compost for the next generation of flowers. And they, they thought the same thing was true concerning human beings. And so their philosophies, both Stoicism and Epicureanism, uh, are predicated upon this way of thinking, that there's a natural order to things, and we need to accept uh, this order. And uh, if we do so, it will actually bring us peace uh, instead of fear. In other words, if you just simply accept that you're going to die, then the threat of death uh, is no longer as fearsome as it is when you, you know, hope for continued life. So um, because of this, their, their philosophies uh, were built upon sort of, the, sort of the course of nature. And when Paul, uh, pr- you know, presents the, 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 the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, that was the the offense. That was the thing that they couldn't accept because their metaphysics were uh, unable to make room for this this idea, this proclamation that there was somebody who rose from the dead. Now, you know, in a way you could say, well, yeah, I can see why they would say that. I mean, I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. <laughs> I, you know, I've done, I've done maybe 80, 90 funerals in my day, and uh, I've never seen somebody get up. And they all just kind of stayed where they were. They died, and that was over. Yeah. And if we dug up their, if we dug up their graves, we, we, we'd be fine. We'd find de- uh, yeah. decomposed bodies. So it just seemed absurd to them. Now, uh, does that mean that everything that they said, uh, because of the, the kind of the metaphysic that they held to, was necessarily worthless? I would argue no. I think that we can kind of go through their teachings and draw out things that we can uh, find helpful, useful, and we even agree with, and other things that we can just say, well, no, that's just not something that's sound or true. But anyway, I, I've said a few things there. Yeah, well, Any I think that's, that, that's right. I mean, on the one hand, I think the boldness of Paul to not accommodate um, the Christian distinctives is impressive. I mean, here here is someone in the middle of academic um, controversy, if you will, um, introducing something that he knows will be scandalous and yet boldly proclaims it. But on the flip side is someone so immersed in the, the intellectual culture that he can carry the argument and show, make those connections. Um, and, and so here, here you have such an impressive into, you know, individual. I mean, Paul is an impressive individual. Uh, most people, I don't think, realize how impressive an individual. I mean, someone recently wrote a book called, you know, Paul the Philosopher. I, I, I think that that it's right on track. Um, I, I think what you have going on here is someone who understands the arguments, the debates, and also is bringing the gospel into that context. He's recognizing this is not the Hebraic worldview, and yet this is not a field in which there is no point at which there is no point of contact. Um, and so, you know, I know, you know, the kind of Bardians out there like to say there is no bridge on which you can build for the gospel. That that's I think for that, that's wrong headed. That's not St. Paul. Um, that's that's this notion that all of a sudden God has to intervene, create the bridge, create the context. The incarnation is the bridge, but the, the incarnation is Christ becoming flesh and connecting to all of these things about us, the desires of the nations, the way in which God has formed creation and readied it for the gospel. And so Paul is exhibiting a confidence in divine providence by moving into the Hellenic world and actually conversing with it in such a way that says it's been ready for Christ. And so he boldly is stepping into that world and saying, look, this, this language too, this is not, the gospel is not just for the Jew, but it's for the Gentile. And there is something in the Gentile world that has prepared it for the incarnation, just as much as the whole history of Israel has prepared it for the incarnation and Christ. And I think this is this is his confidence. And I think this is something we have to retrieve, is this, this confidence that 
Even in the world we are in, there has been a readiness made by providence for the gospel to which we can confidently speak like Paul did. Yeah. I think it might be helpful at this point if we stopped and, you know, we haven't really defined either Stoicism or Epicureanism yet. Right, right. <laughs> you know, we, we've noted that they both say that uh, life's so whatever it is and then you die, <laughs> but that's about it. Um, so what, what, we need to, what we need to do, I think, is, is help people understand what they are and um, why they thought that way. That's a great, that's a great segue for something I wanted to get into. So uh, let me, uh, as, as best I can, provide a, a synopsis of each, and then you guys can uh, fill it out or correct me or whatever. So if you, if you think that, you know, you live and then you die and that's all there is to it, well, you know, then there's uh, the hedonist option, which Paul presents as, you know, you know, eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow you die. You know, he, he, he notes that uh, in scripture. Uh, but uh, there are uh, other approaches. So the Epicureans, uh, when we think of the Epicureans, we think of the pleasure principle. Basically what they, what they do is they equate pleasure with good. So something is pleasurable, it's good. But uh, they were sharp enough to note that certain pleasures are, are fecund or fecund, and other pleasures are actually followed by pain. So a person who, say, is a, I guess, a glutton, uh, it suffers uh, as they pursue pleasure because they grow uh, overweight, they have uh, health issues, uh, and uh, they uh, are perennially unhappy because they can't get, you know, maybe the food that they want or the quality that they long for and so forth. So consequently, uh, and paradoxically, um, or maybe ironically, Epicureans the, uh, didn't uh, promote uh, a sort of mindless pursuit of pleasure. They actually called people to a sort of self-controlled and measured enjoyment. Um, they also uh, noted that social life is full of frustration and uh, disappointment. And consequently, what you ought to do is, if you can manage it, uh, withdraw from society and just enjoy you know, the, the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the pleasures of good conversation with close friends. So <laughs> rather than being uh, uh, you know, a school of thought that promotes hedonism, the Epicureans actually said, OK, what you're looking for is a kind, the kind of tranquility that you can enjoy if you can if you can manage your desires and satisfy them with, you know, sort of moderately sort of, uh, uh and measured out pleasures, uh, and, uh, and do that with, with a few, a few good friends. So that was their, and then you die. <laughs> but the, but the idea is, is to create kind of a, a, a kind of a sense of tranquility, uh, in this, uh, 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 people who follow this particular school. Now, the Stoics. Well, hold go before you move off sure, the picture, sure. you need to talk about the connection to their metaphysics. Well, yeah, they did believe that you know that the, uh, the physical world is all that there is. Nevertheless, they believed in a creator. Now, this is something that catches people by surprise today because some people who are champions of of the Epicureans in the present moment are actually atheists. But Epicurus uh, believed that we should strive to have the same kind of tranquility that the gods possess, in particular, the high God, you know, the God who is the true God uh, beyond, uh, you know, sort of the circle of the world. But um, anyway, I don't know if that's what you were thinking about getting into yeah. there, Glenn. Glenn. Well, I, I would also add that... It, um, they didn't. They didn't really believe that there was any sort of uh, order or law governing the world. They didn't believe it was total chaos, yeah. but they didn't really believe that there was an ordering principle or anything else that was there that you need to live according to or you need to use as your standard. Yeah, and as a result, the only standard is 
what gives you pleasure, don't pursue it to the point where it stops being pleasurable. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. They were they were uh, people who endorsed uh, kind of a uh, well, the wheel of fortune. Well, the, things the, happen. Yeah, the the Epicureans were were atomists and materialists, and you know, right. and and even had a view of evolution of sorts. Actually, I think I, I think Darwin right, is very right. indebted to that kind of conception. Stoics are go go a little di- different direction, but yeah, there is no. In, in, there is a kind of randomness that is a byproduct of things and that's kind of accounts for human freedom. Um, but it also, you know, is, you know, the, the end of the line is the fact that things run out and this, you know, sensation, they're empiricists. All knowledge is from the senses. And once the body dies out, all knowledge dies right. out. So does everything else. Right. So, whatever right. principle they have behind all things or ahead of all things is, is uh is kind of you know runs out in terms of for us because you know once you die you die that's it it's the end of the game and then yeah. things are atomistic um and uh you know um di- there isn't a, a a kind of like Len said a kind of order to things a, a telos um that is is beyond that is beyond the mundane yeah, and, and it's for those reasons that I think a lot of folks um, feel that the Epicureans are kind of proto-modern in, yeah. in a sense. But, but, yeah, the, but yeah, those are good points. The void, yeah, um, <laughs> Adam, you know, atomism, that kind of thing. Now, let's transition to the Stoics because, uh, in many respects, I think most folks find the Stoics more appealing. And I think if we think about what's going on in the world today in terms of the revival of kind of neo-Stoicism, certain features of Stoicism are particularly helpful or, or I guess uh, appealing is a better way to put it uh, to modern people. So the Stoics did believe in a moral order. They believed uh, that it was wise to bring yourself and your desires uh, or your aspirations or your goals into accord with those, uh, with that, with that moral order um, one of the best ways I, I, I think to help people understand sort of the stoic outlook is Star Trek, classic Trek. <laughs> you know, when you think about classic Trek, you've got Mr. Spock. Yeah. Now, Mr. Spock, you know, Gene Roddenberry demonstrates in, in a number of ways that he was a pretty, pretty you know, well-read guy. And he had a good sense of the Western tradition. You know, just think, just think about the, 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 the kind of the triad, you know, you have McCoy and Kirk and Spock. <laughs> and Spock is uh, very much a kind of projection into outer space on an alien planet of the Roman outlook. And there you've got, you know, all of these, uh, think of the Romulans <laughs> who are like related to the Vulcans. So the Vulcans, you think about the Vulcans, what, it, you know, a Vulcan is, you know, the God of the forge and, and, uh, and sort of the Latin uh, interpretation of the gods, you know, Hephaestus with the Greeks. But anyway, so you, you've got this, this guy who uh, aspires to be logical, right? The, an entire population aspires to be logical. And then you have bones, the doctor, who is, I think, uh, kind of uh, the epitome of kind of the romantic movement in the West and, you know, the late 18th, early 19th century. And then you have Kirk. Now, the name, James Tiberius Kirk. <laughs> think about that name. I mean, that name signals the Western tradition. <laughs> James the Just, a, a, a Hebrew Jewish name, Tiberius obviously Roman, <laughs> Latin, and Kirk, church. <laughs> In other words, the church is the place where these two uh, tributaries con- con- uh, con- uh, yeah, converge and there's a confluence. Anyway, but when we think about Spock, we think about someone who sees the emotions as a problem. You know, In other words... Uh, the goal. So I think that both the both the Epicureans and the Stoics were interested in tranquility, inner peace, and they saw 
you know, they, they proposed different ways to, to address it. Now, the Stoics were more social in nature. They saw that there is a kind of social order that, that you should do your duty, you should do your part in that social order. But at the same time, you shouldn't allow your passions to carry you away. You needed to, to, in some sense, be able to separate yourself from your emotional life and judge it. So they believed that your emotions make bad judgments about the, the scenarios or the situations you find yourself in, and you need to judge those judgments. You need to stand back from your emotional responses and judge them. Now, I think most of the time people would say, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably true, but you know, the Stoics were willing to take it all the way <laughs> to extremes that uh, none of us would endorse. Like your son dies, right? Well, um, you know, a Stoic would say, you know, you really should be disturbed about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sons have a way of doing that. <laughs> they die on you, <laughs> you know? So, so you should sort of uh, extract yourself from this emotional kind of, uh, I guess, storm that you find yourself in and judge it for what it is. And I think that, you know, the, the recoiling that a lot of people feel with regard to that kind of stoicism, I think is understandable. But most of the time we don't find ourselves looking down at, you know, our sons on, a, on their deathbeds. We just are kind of dealing with the disappointments of life, you know, being fired, not having enough money to make it, make a living, those kinds of things. And sort of the turmoil that we feel. And that's why many modern people find the Stoics appealing. I can see you want to say something, Glenn, go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that I, I think is most interesting about the Stoics and the point at which it connects into Christianity is that they believed that there was a universal law or reason that governed the universe, which they called the Logos. Yeah, right. And that universal reason is what we need to live in accord with. That is what, how we are to measure our behavior. That is what we're to aspire to and so on, to live in accordance with that. Um, but this idea that unlike the Epicureans who don't really see any purpose in creation, uh, the Stoics saw in the Logos, in reason, um, and so on, the universal law that governed not just the physical universe, but also the moral universe. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I think, you know, there are debates about how much John is aware of all of this. But the fact that if you read John 1, you're going to see things he says about the Logos that echo both Stoic and, and uh, Neo, uh, Platonic ideas strongly suggests to me that what he's trying to do there is to express the truth in terms of those philosophies while also echoing Genesis 1. Yeah, yeah, he's affirming and yet rejecting as yeah. he does that, and also informing Mm -hmm. well, he's right. saying that the Christ, Jesus, is the Logos. That's right. Christ transforms each of these philosophies. And I think, I mean, I think Calvin had a strong affinity um, for some lines of Plato, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of, of um, Stoicism from the Reformed world. Um, we can learn the kind of innate knowledge of God, the seed of religion that Calvin always talks about, this kind of sen sense of divinity. Um, grows right out of this um, uh, Stoic tradition. Um, and I think Stoicism in, in many ways, in some ways, was correct on that. I, I have a little qualifications there, my, you know, my kind of commitments to, to, to the larger um, Christian tradition on those matters. But, um, I mean, I think that, that um, I think that's fair to say. And, and this notion of, of kind of wrestling with providence the unfolding of the Logos in time. I mean, what's interesting is that both Calvin and Spinoza were, were influenced by, by Stoicism, and, and they come out at two different ends. Um, and, and Calvin yeah, we ought to, that, that, that's a marvelous contrast, Tom. <laughs> Spinoza and Calvin. 
we ought to we ought to have a show on on that. Yeah, you know. we, we should because I think modern hermeneutics is more more in line with Spinoza, even in the evangelical church, than Calvin on this point. And I think Calvin, of course, yeah, I think yeah. the scholastic Protestants and, and Protestant orthodoxy in the early days recognized that they didn't want to go the Spinoza line, if you will. Um, they, they, yeah, they wanted, yeah. you know, they... Not even the Jews wanted to go that yeah, line. That's right. <laughs> that's right. They, that's, he, that's right. He, was, he was condemned by that's, his own people. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> it, well, well, and what is interesting, I do think, you know, there was a book written some years ago. I remember it's like this thick and I can't remember the title. I know the one of the guy author's name, last name is David or first name, but I, it was it was arguing that Spinoza rather than Descartes is the father of modernity. Um, which isn't always a positive oh, yeah. thing. Um, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, Israel is in the name. <laughs> anyway, I, 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 you know, I can't remember the title of the name of the book, but I remember reading it years ago, and it's, it is like this thick, and it isn't a compelling case. Um, that's a whole other issue. Um, but, I mean, it's interesting yeah. how, how variegated a, a Christian engagement with Stoicism versus a kind of uh, a Spinoza philosophy with it. And Spinoza for, for, you know, for all the criticism, at least had a, had a more, in, you know, a, at least had a more spiritual aptitude than most secularism today for what, it, what, for what it's worth. Um, th- those are all different issues. I was heading somewhere and I can totally forgot where I was going. But <laughs> which is not that's rare. okay. That's which okay. Is not rare. It was a, it was I a mean, very it's a it was a very rich cul de sac that you took us into. Yeah, so I'm stuck in the cul de sac. So I'll have to pause for now. <laughs> well, I just want to add before we wrap things up because we've gotten to that point in the show that uh, the the god that that Einstein believed in was Spinoza's god. Yeah. So a, a lot of folks who love to quote you know, Einstein on God, you know, uh, as though he's endorsing kind of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not, it's, no. it, that's not the God he's endorsing. He's, he's talking about Spinoza's God, but yeah. that's another show. Anyway, do you want to say anything as we wrap up, uh, Glenn? Um, yeah, I was going to go off on Spinoza, but that's probably not a good idea at this point. <laughs> so I think, um, what, what, what I think would be useful though, is a, a quick wrap up on, you know, we've talked a, around a lot of issues, but we've never, I don't really feel like we've brought it in for a landing. Um, Go ahead and land us here, Glenn. <laughs> Go ahead for it. Go for well, it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think, I, I do think that the, that I, I've seen much more in the way of Stoicism than Epicureanism, at least in the circles that I've, I've uh, got contacts with. But I think that what it's doing is it's offering, as I said before, answers and a, a deeper way of looking at the world than the frankly rather superficial meaninglessness that you get in pure secularism. I think that going back to Stoicism and Epicureanism is the other side of the coin of going to neo-paganism. Uh, I think Tom's comment about the Renaissance is very apt here because I've got a rather peculiar theory about what made the Renaissance what it was that I can't go into now. But I, I, I think all of these things are reflecting that there's a sterility in modern culture. And with that, a sterility in a lot of what the church has been offering to modern culture, that people are, are desperate for something deeper, something wiser, um, something that addresses fundamental questions that secularism almost by definition can't address. I think that, like I said, I think that it accounts for the move for some people toward paganism. Right. Um, but the gospel, as Paul points out, the gospel takes the best of what these things have to offer and brings it one step further. It heightens it. Uh, like what Tolkien and Lewis said about paganism, it needs to be purified. Yeah. What you see happening here with the gospel on Morris Hill is that kind of purification yeah. and revitalization of these philosophies by the gospel, by, by truth, by connection with the true God, not just the God of the philosophers. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great note to end on yeah. Glenn. Thanks for do, doing that wrap up. Anyway, we, we we're grateful for your interest in the theology podcast. Uh, we've begun a new year 
2022. By the way, 2022 is when Soylent Green uh, was uh, <laughs> set in, you know, the, the great film with Charlton Heston. Yeah, yeah. I'll just leave our listeners to go ahead and, and watch, watch that. I got to go back and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 1973 when that came out. So this whole idea that the world is just like on the verge of just complete and total collapse is not a, a recent notion. I, yeah. <laughs> I've lived through like five sort of iterations of it. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you for listening to the show. Uh, we do appreciate all the, you know, the good reviews and the, even the financial support. Uh, we've had a number of gifts here recently that have indicated that people appreciate the show and are wanting it to continue. They support it financially. And those financial gifts do actually do help the show continue. If we didn't have those, uh, the show would be hard to sustain. <laughs> so thank you for those things. And uh, we, we're glad that we're into a new year and we've got some things we're working on. One of the things that we're working on and we've talked about before is another PugCast tour, this time in the uh, southeast. Isn't it interesting? We don't call it the Atlantic Southeast. We just call <laughs> it the Southeast. If you talk about the Pacific Northwest, yeah. and, you know people know what you're talking about. If you were to say the Atlantic Southeast, people would be, why did you need to say Atlantic? <laughs> I, anyway. I would know what you're talking about being from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Anyway, uh, we, we're, we're, glad to, we're glad that you were with us, and we thank you, and we just have, I guess, one more thing to say, and that's bye-bye. Bye now. Bye now.